Thank you for having us uh, here at Racina again. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to the panellists about every year when I talk about Afghanistan at Racina, I often do it with uh, General Bipin Rawat, uh, who is unfortunately not with us this year. Uh, he passed um, a few months ago, so uh, he is sorely missed here at Racina. Uh, but uh, welcome to uh, the, pa uh, the event here tonight, uh, Afghanistan, the Anatomy of Loss. My name is Yalda Hakim, I'm a BBC correspondent and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Joining me here on the panel is Lisa Curtis, Director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program, the Centre for a New American Security. Mr Manish Tiwari, Member of Parliament from India. James Carafano, Vice uh, President, Foreign Policy, the Heritage Foundation. Javed Ahmed, Senior Fellow, the Atlantic Council, and Stefan Meyer, Executive Chairman and Director, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Now, it's been almost nine months uh, since the fall of the Afghan government and the takeover, the swift takeover of the Taliban in Afghanistan, and nine months since the US withdrew from the country. And this week, marks the deadliest week in Afghanistan. More than 100 people were killed uh, in suicide bombings, uh, in mosques and in schools. Uh, the so-called Islamic State has claimed responsibility. So security remains incredibly precarious in this new Afghanistan. And really the country is facing three crises. The first, a humanitarian crisis, where we're seeing the economy close to collapse, where we're hearing slogans such as the march towards starvation that the UN keeps talking about. And in December of this year, I spent almost a month in Afghanistan. I traveled from Kabul to Kandahar and Helmand, and I saw for myself the humanitarian uh, catastrophe that is impacting the youngest of victims in the country. We're also seeing a rollback on the gains of the last two decades. So. It's a crisis of, of human rights. No country in the world has had the rights of women, of girls, of citizens overturned so quickly overnight. And then of course uh, we have the security concerns that I've just mentioned. Uh, when ISIS can freely target mosques and schools in the country. The Taliban in the 90s promised uh, security and they delivered. And they promised security in 2022, and they have not delivered. So these are all issues that I'll be talking to our panelists tonight about. But I'd like to begin by asking um, Ambassador Javed uh, a question to begin with, because of course, Javed, you were the ambassador on the ground in the UAE uh, when the government collapsed. And you were actually there when the president arrived, President Ghani arrived uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Just tell me what happened. Well, can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, I want to be objective here. So um, I was in Abu Dhabi. Um, I got a text message from President Ghani's uh, National Security Advisor. This is Chatham House rule, I suppose. Um, it's not. Um, no, yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. Uh, but, but I, so think now I did not get a text message from National Security <laughs> Advisor. You, you, you're yeah. amongst friends. Yes. You, you, so, you're um, amongst friends in Twitter. Yes. <laughs> um, but um, yes, that they had just arrived from Termes, Uzbekistan, in Abu Dhabi, and um, they asked uh, that I come to the airport. I refused because uh, some of those things were not uh, coordinated with me um, prior to their arrival uh, in Abu Dhabi. But um, um, UAE in Afghanistan had a foundational partnership just like the UAE um, or Afghanistan in um, the United States had that foundational partnership for um, a long time, uh, 20 years and counting. Um, and um, we we made sure that um, the president and his entourage were taken care of. Um, we didn't ask questions. Um, so, so you weren't aware that, that um, the president was on his way, um, but you knew the Taliban obviously at that point had taken over Kabul? 
Well, I mean, everyone was aware uh, that the Taliban had taken over the Kabul, uh, like at the time, because we could see it on CNN, on you know, basically on the headlines of every major international outlet. Um, I um, I knew that they were going to come um, at some point, um, but um, I was in touch with them as they were taking off from the palace um, in Kabul. Uh, we were still texting on signal um, um, before they lost that um, coverage and the connection. And uh, um, But we had no idea that they were coming to Abu Dhabi. And um, frankly speaking, uh, uh, you know, what I was told at the time, perhaps this their story, um, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to judge here, is that um, they also did not know where they were going. Um, so they ended up in Termiz, Uzbekistan, and uh, before they came to Abu Dhabi. I mean, I do think it's, it's an important point, and I do think we need to hear these details, and, and that's why these panels are, are had. When you were speaking to them in, from Kabul, you knew they were leaving the country at that point, that they were fleeing, that the government had collapsed at that point. Is that correct? No, look, I mean, again, I have to be objective. I mean, the government had collapsed long before the president left, um, uh, one. Second is that we knew that the president um, was at some point going to evacuate given his own differences with the Taliban and the fact that he had made very, very clear that he was only going to abandon power in his seat uh, to an elected government. You know, whoever his successor may have been, he or she um, should have been elected. Um, but um, at that time, we did get a request in, 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 in the UAE that we needed a plane um, that would be parked at the Kabul airport. Um, uh, from the 15th of August until the end of the collapse, or sorry, let me rephrase, until the end of the um, uh, U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was the 31st of August. So this way we would have a two-week window as to whenever the president, should he desires and his entourage to leave the country, that he was can already leave. planned. At some point, we well, it wasn't planned. It was wasn't planned. Planned, but uh, it was it was something that was an option. Like that was an, as an option. Yeah. So you knew at some point that he would leave, and he may come to the United Arab Emirates. I did not. I mean, I, I just wonder. You know, you you just said that the government you knew had collapsed long before the Taliban arrived. I'm just curious to know, with so much corruption in the country, with the failures that 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 surrounded that government. Why did you stay? Why did so many stay? Well, to stay because, I mean, look, as, as an Afghan-American, I, um, I had to do my part. Um, it, even though, you know, my objectivity uh, as an American citizen was questioned mainly because I was, um, even though I was representing the Afghan government at the time, um, my objectivity was questioned that I also had a second citizenship. I did not care for it, um, but I did care for the fact that I was doing something meaningful, and that's exactly what I did. And when the time came in, when I had to leave, I was the first one to leave, and I stepped out um, and stepped down um, from the government that no longer existed. Um, uh, what do on you mean? my own. When did you step down? September 6th. So, so the, I was the government the had already collapsed yeah. at that point. So yeah. there was clarity that the Taliban had yeah. taken over. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just curious to know because we, t we look back in hindsight now. What do you think could have been done differently? What a great deal. I mean, it's a look, I mean, there's not a single factor where you, you could, you know, Say that this is this is this was the determining factor as to how and why the Afghan government collapsed, or any government or state collapsed for that matter. Would you say um, it was rotten from the core? Of course. I mean, it was a political sandcastle. I mean, everything was crumbling around 
Kabul, which was a government in its own sense, um, um, a separate government um, from the periphery, uh, you know, the 33 other provinces, and everything was crumbling around Kabul. Of course, yes. Um, but you also have to realize the fact that um, there was a heavy U.S. and NATO and Western involvement there. So there was not a single factor that you could contribute the collapse to. Um, so it was everything, internal and external, um, some enabled, um, I would say. What do you mean? You know, the Pakistanis, uh, for example, um, you know, the very insurgency that, they that, that we were fighting against collectively, um, very much so. Um, you know, an externally enabled one, and um, we, we, we fought, and um, at the end, I think I would argue that we did not have a chance, a winning chance uh, in, in Afghanistan, and in this case, um, uh, the United States didn't have that winning chance in Afghanistan, mainly because of the Pakistan I mean, problem. I mean, how, how so? Because when you look at Ukraine, for example, you know, they're begging for a no-fly zone. You had the greatest military alliance in history backing the Afghan government, all the money in the world, all the military support. So what went wrong? Look, I mean, the Ukrainian example is pretty, um, or the Ukrainian comparison is pretty unfounded, mainly because it's... Um, it's a very different case. The Afghan case was an external enabling insurgency. Uh, the Ukrainian case was a flat out invasion, foreign invasion. So had the Iranians or the Pakistanis or the Chinese invaded Afghans, I think the response would be very different. Maybe that's what the Taliban say they did with the United States in an imposed government. Very much so. Yeah. L Lisa, when you hear that, do you think back in hindsight over the last 20 years and think we could have done things differently? Uh, certainly, I think there are many things the United States could have done differently, uh, but I also think that there are things the Afghans could have done differently. Uh, do I think the fact that uh, Pakistan remained a safe haven for the Taliban up until the time they took over Afghanistan uh, did that contribute as well? Absolutely. So I think there, there's a lot of blame to go around. Um, I think you know, we all have to ask ourselves uh, you know, what we could have done differently. Um, but I think you know, I do blame the Doha deal. I think it was a badly negotiated deal. Uh, provided a, a deal, by the way, was struck. Uh, under the Trump administration, and, and you were part of that administration. I recognize that. And I think what I was advising was a plan B, that, okay, we're, we're trying to work a peace deal with the Taliban, but what if the Taliban aren't interested in a peace deal? Then what? Um, and I believe that we should have kept forces in Afghanistan. I think that NATO would have kept their seven or 8,000 forces there. Uh, we could have you know, continued to try to push for a peaceful solution, but we would have kept some leverage there. Well, you, you and it may not have resolved the, the problem, but I think it was uh, at acceptable risk. I think uh, keeping a certain number of US forces there indefinitely uh, was in the United States' interest and it would have given the Afghans at least a fighting chance. I, I think that, um, I agree with Javed, that uh, you know, we should have given the Afghan government a chance. I think the Doha deal undermined the morale of the Afghan government. It undermined the morale of the Afghan security forces. These are Afghan security forces that the US had provided provided $125 billion in assistance to over 20 years. It wasn't just the deal, though, that, that uh, undermined the morale of, of those soldiers. I mean, if we do talk about just purely the deal itself, it was created and led by the Trump administration, by Ambassador Khalilzad, who insisted that there were certain conditions that the Taliban would meet, and then, you know, the, it would move on to negotiations with the Afghan side. And the Afghan side was never really willing to take those talks seriously. Yet, 
The Americans pushed that with the Taliban. I guess I would take exception with that. Uh, President Ghani did accede to releasing 5,000 Taliban leaders even before the Taliban agreed to sit down with the Afghan government. Um, so I, I think that uh, President Ghani had shown that he was willing to engage in a peace process. Let's not forget that going back to February 2018, President Ghani extended an olive branch to the Taliban uh, from Kabul. Uh, he was integral in the temporary ceasefire, the Eid ceasefire that lasted for three days in the summer of 2018. Of course, he worked on that with General John Nicholson, who was the commanding general in Afghanistan at the time. Uh, but so I, I disagree with the idea that President Ghani wasn't willing to make sacrifices to try to make peace with the Taliban. The Taliban throughout the peace process continued to kill civilians. Uh, up until uh, two weeks before they took over the country, they assassinated the spokesperson for the Afghan government. So, so that's- So why, why continue the peace talks? Why legitimize them when you know they're doing all of those things? Uh, well, again, I think it was a mistake to uh, engage in wishful thinking, to think that, well, uh, you know, we can wish a peace process to happen. That's not how a peace process happens. Both sides need to compromise. Uh, both sides need to show a willingness to move forward with a political process, and it has to be linked to reductions in violence. Uh, so, yeah, I think that it, it, uh, engaging you know, with the Taliban and trying to proceed with the peace process in and of itself is not a mistake. Uh, I don't think the Trump administration should be faulted for trying. Do you but think the it, was way the way it was it was, it was the way and, and it was And the fact conducted. that the Afghan government was frankly uh, left out of the talks. The decision to move forward with the talks um, was made in the summer of 2018, just before uh, Ambassador Khalilzad took his position, that the U.S. would uh, begin a dialogue with the Taliban you know, without the Afghan government in the room, but on a temporary basis, that this would be a way to kickstart the peace process. It was never imagined at the time that the U.S. would complete a peace deal with the Taliban without the Afghan government being involved. Then how on earth did it get to that? I think you will have to ask Ambassador Khalilzad. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That, uh, that, that uh, brings me to you, um, Jim. But we will come back and ask Lisa about um, this sort of next phase and, and what happens now. Um, Jim, the, the, the current administration wants to bury its head in the sand and, and not deal with Afghanistan. That's the reality of it now. I mean, Lisa and I were talking in the green room about the embassy. The Afghan embassy has shut, shut down. I mean, the electricity went. That in itself is, I think, a symbol is how symbolic it has become in terms of America's lack of interest in Afghanistan's lack of responsibility. I was recently in Ukraine um, a few weeks ago. Before that, I was in Afghanistan. A lot of people talk about the differences between the two, but also about the similarities. And one thing that I continue to hear over and over again from both the Ukrainian side, Ukrainians and the Afghans, is this sense of abandonment. And, and the Afghans did feel abandoned by the United States. Because even if you do talk about this, the Americans weren't there to nation build, ultimately after 20 years, that is what happened. And we are now seeing a rollback of those gains. And I just want to get your views on that. That's a great question. So there's either, I think there's two interesting parts to that. One is, why do they want to pretend that Afghanistan doesn't exist anymore as an issue? And the second is, is, is how that impacted not just the future of Afghanistan, but the future of US policy in Ukraine. So you, the, originally this panel was like about the Americans' moral failure. And there clearly was an American moral failure. Um, but the, the reality is there are lots of moral failures in history. And when are there not moral failures? A more interesting question. And it's, it's when this issue of interests and values align that nations are much more likely to take a, a, an important stand. And you know, regardless of the state of the Afghan nation, and uh, there were reasons the United States was there, and we had three real interests. They weren't vital interests, but they were, they were important enough that it was important enough for the United States to be there. First of all is a stable Afghanistan is good for South Asia. It's good for India. 
India is the United States' most important strategic partner in this part of the world. Doing things that help put India in a more strategically solid place are good for the United States. So helping the Afghan people, stabilizing a country of 44 million people, not having mass refugees, not having a destitute economy, not having massive human rights abuses, that, that, that made sense for us as an interest. Um, terrorism, of course, is an interest. We've seen what happens when we have unrestricted terrorist platforms that can then morph into international terrorist sites. We saw it in Afghanistan, we saw it in Syria, we saw it in Libya. So having sufficient presence in order to not see a resurgence of that, the situation awareness, the capability to work with partners to intervene on that, that was in our interest. And then of course, we're concerned about you know, the emergence of China and the potential that this then becomes another field of expansion of Chinese power. So we had three very good reasons to be there. By and, and what, but the reason why, right, we don't talk about it now is leaving made none of those, doing any of those things easier. And so the problem for this administration is they walked away and then all the things that they had to do to protect our interests, it is much harder for them to do now. Uh, let's be clear. And they, ha let's no, and they have no way to do them because be they're all harder. Let's be clear though. We can blame this administration till the cows come home, all we want, all night. But it was the Trump administration that started yeah, I this. Look, I just completely disagree with that, Kennard. I, this is we, not, we just had no, no, Lisa talk this is, about not, mistakes, this is not how Trump would have left Afghanistan, period, full stop. He would have never exited this way. And regardless, it was the exit that created the strategic crisis that we have. So this is how it impacts now, because the, the coming in US position on Western Europe and Russia was those are issues that were gonna be parked while the United States did other things. And you, senior US officials were going around, not in open settings like this, but in settings where everybody was gonna hear it and tell everybody else. They were saying, look, if anything happens in Ukraine, that's a European problem, it's not an American problem. And after Afghanistan, they were still saying that until the, if everything in Ukraine blew up. And then this administration quickly realized that to do nothing in Ukraine after having suffered the unbelievable embarrassment they just had in Afghanistan was completely unacceptable. So they've been I, engaged. I'm just gonna in interject so, Af it. so Afghanistan actually made them be stronger in their support for Ukraine. Yeah, but if we just go back to the Trump administration for a second, I had Ambassador John Bolton on my show a few weeks ago. And he said to me that frankly, Donald Trump would have left NATO. Yeah, so you cited the two most, I think, <laughs> unreal, unreliable sources on what Donald Trump would have done in Afghanistan. But John Bolton and Ambassador Calderon. Yeah, <laughs> but he, he said that he was privy to conversations right. and, and Trump made it very clear that he was no fan of NATO. That, yeah, that he, he would have left NATO. Yeah, I, look, I, I, quoting John Bolton is- Trump himself has undermined yeah, look, NATO. Yeah, but the, everybody doesn't, but nobody goes with the but, right? No, I, I actually just heard, um, I was with Trump just the other night and he talked a lot about this. So Trump said lots of things about NATO, but Trump's ultimate goal was to create a stronger NATO, which ev even the senior leadership of NATO will tell you he achieved. Trump, if Trump had not put the javelins into Ukraine, and if we had not invested several years of military assistance in reforming and preparing the Ukrainians to defend themselves, there would not have been a Ukraine that would have survived the first three days of the war. So we can blame Trump all we want for the things he said, but if we focus on the things he did, I think both in Afghanistan and in, in, in Ukraine, um, he's actually put us in a in better shape than we would have been. I mean, if we go, if we go back to um, the peace deal, Trump started the talks with some terrorists. He started talks with the, Which legitimized he, he, them, emboldened no, them. I mean, like he started talks with the and North and Koreans. He started talks with, with lots of people, but show me, But he never started talks and then sold himself out at the end. Well, we and don't that, know. And, and all of his, well, I'm sorry? Well, we don't know. How, because but, but, well, that's the point is we know. don't know. So you're condemning him for something he never no, did. Because I'm well, condemning, you're condemning him no, for I'm, something I'm, he never I'm, did. I'm condemning the fact that we blame Biden solely for, sure, the exit was shambolic, but this was landed on his lap. There was a deadline, there was a peace uh, deal, there was a legitimization. Okay, so you're telling me the President of the United States cannot reverse any decisions by the previous president if he doesn't like them. We've known Which I don't even think he was reversing decisions. These were all his own decisions. 
But, the, but, the, but to, to say that Biden didn't come in and reverse virtually every Trump policy, saying that he was handed this and he was stuck with this, I mean, I don't think that passes the, the I, I common sense I think way test. back in 2009, Obama made it clear that um, America wanted out of Afghanistan. Well, so look, it wasn't America a wants out of everything. that America of course wanted out. But, but the whole point, and this is, this is, I think, what's really important is, is when you disconnect the, the debate, the discussion of what are your interests and how you defend them from what you want to do, that's when we get lost and we drift off into these things. It's easy to say, I want out of Afghanistan. And, and, I, and, and you should ask Lisa, because she's had this conversation with the president a number of times on a number of different issues. But then when you say, OK, what are the consequences of what we do, and are you willing to pay that price? That's when you get the real answer from people. I, I just want to briefly, before I move on, um, before we get okay, caught up still, in the no, no, on. no, no, no. I just want to know, I mean, how much has this uh, damaged America? and emboldened adversaries like Vladimir Putin, like Xi Jinping? Yeah, you know, I think, it, I think that, you know, I, I mean, we all bl can likely say that, well, because of what happened in Afghanistan that, um, that emboldened Putin in um, Ukraine. I'm not really sure if that is fair. What, what, I, what I will say is, I think we saw a pattern of leadership in Afghanistan that was very similar to the pattern of leadership we saw in the Obama administration. And I do think that Putin correctly assessed that this administration would respond in many similar ways. And so I, I do think they kind of knew the playbook. But I, I would like to say one other thing. We talk about America's failure in Afghanistan. I think there's a big difference between the failure of our government and Americans. There were many Americans outside of the US government, and Lisa was a, a, a really important part of one of those networks. There, there were networks of people that sprung up all over the country and with allies all over the world and did an incredible amount of work, particularly in that first two weeks to help the people of Afghanistan. So when we say America, there's a difference between what our government did and what many Americans do who love and care about the people of Afghanistan did. Many of them did many brave things, many selfless things, and many dangerous things to help the people of Afghanistan. I don't think we should get that. Piece. They understood what we owe to the Afghan people, and they didn't want to do this. That I, that I agree with. Um, I, Manish, I just want to come to you um, about the region now. And, and the security of the region. Because Jim talked about security being a, a sort of one of the issues or fundamental sort of concerns um, for the United States, one of the main reasons why they were in Afghanistan to begin with. The Taliban in the peace uh, negotiations talked about not allowing Al Qaeda to use Afghan soil um, for you know, terrorism. In the last week, we've seen a number of terrorist attacks across Afghanistan by the so-called Islamic State. Now, right now, it's contained to the borders of Afghanistan, spilling over a little bit into Pakistan, and that's the concern of the Pakistani uh, government. But how concerned are you that in 12 months' time, we'll be sitting here talking about Afghanistan being a, a global terrorism concern again? Thank you very much. Uh, that's a rather profound uh, futuristic question to answer. But let me begin by saying that uh, I don't think it's actually fair to blame the Americans for walking out. The Americans are not the first people who walked out. If you take a two-century perspective, after the uh, Afghan Sikh Wars between 1807 and 1836, the Sikhs walked out. Then the Anglo-British, the Afghan-British Wars, the Anglo-Afghan Wars between 39 and 1919, the British walked out. The Soviets walked out. So therefore, uh, I think it was a given, and anybody who followed the trajectory of American policy, especially from the Bruce Riddle review of the March of 2009, that it was just a matter of time before the Americans decided to leave. And uh, I think by 2012, 2013, uh, the fatigue with uh, Afghanistan and even with Iraq was very evident uh, whenever any, anyone traveled to Washington, D.C. The question is, why were those 20 years, two decades, when Afghanistan had the support of the entire world, it had all the money at its disposal, why weren't those two decades used properly to try and build a cohesive, stable society? And of course, there could be a, a myriad a number of reasons which would be trotted out. But ultimately, the biggest stakeholders in the success or failure of Afghanistan were the Afghan people themselves and the Afghan leadership. 
and I think the Afghan leadership, and I say it with great regret, actually failed the people of Afghanistan. I remember I was in, 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 in Muscat and uh, I ran into uh, the former head of the Afghan National Army one day at a track one and a half. I was coming down the elevator, it opened, he was there. And I asked him, I said, how are things in Afghanistan? And he says, look, you know, we have uh, so many radio stations, we have so many television channels, we have so many uh, newspapers, there's so many girls in schools. And he was counting success in intangibles. I mean, that was the real success. And it's that which unfortunately evaporated. And for that, I think uh, successive Afghan uh, governments, which uh, were there propped up or otherwise between 2001 and uh, let's say 2021, I think they need to really introspect because they failed the Afghan people. Coming to your question about uh, uh, how serious a threat it is. Uh, well, the fact is that we've been at the receiving end of Pakistan-sponsored uh, terror now going back to almost 1975 because after we uh, liberated uh, East Pakistan and created the state of Bangladesh, Pakistan operationalized the strategy of leading India with a thousand cuts and of course going down the nuclear road. So we've been at the receiving end of this now for uh, the better part of four decades. But interestingly, uh, there have not been many Afghan terrorists who actually have been neutralized or who actually have been fighting in it's substantial not so numbers. It's the Afghans, it's using it, having other... Well, I mean, well, 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 uh, well, the fact is that yes, when you have ungoverned spaces, right? So those ungoverned spaces are obviously prone to misuse and tomorrow, if the writ of the Taliban does not run, right, and they are not able to honor whatever commitments that they have given, and in fact, I was reading just today before coming that one of the commitments they have given is that they would not allow Afghan soil to be uh, used against uh, other Westphalian entities. So if they fail to do that, you know, obviously there will be implications in the region. It could be Pakistan today, it could be uh, India tomorrow, but then, this is a hand which has now been dealt. The fact is that uh, the, 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 the Americans are out, the country's been handed back to the Taliban, right? Why did things come to such a pass that those people you went after in 2001, you know, those people you incarcerated in Guantanamo Bay, you know, you held people without trial, uh, you know, for uh, years and years on to an end, and you finally handed the country back to them. And so therefore, that's a hand that you've dealt to the region, and now the other region will have to deal with the consequences of that. And, and that's what I want to get uh, at. How will India deal with the consequences of that? <coughs> well, one of the biggest problems that I think India has, that it has not been able to define what strategic interest does it have in Afghanistan. And in my humble estimation, we do not have strategic interest in Afghanistan. We don't share a land boundary with Afghanistan. We have minimal trade with Afghanistan. All that we are ultimately concerned about is whether the ungoverned spaces will be used for terror training camps. But then, uh, if Pakistan decides to sponsor terror, you don't have to go as far as Afghanistan. They have camps in Muzaffarabad, and they've been doing it for the last four decades. So, so the question is that the Indian state has unfortunately played along with, uh, with a grand lie, which unfortunately was orchestrated, that we have strategic interests in Afghanistan. In my humble estimation, and I've written extensively about it, if we have strategic interests in Afghanistan, at least we've not been able to define it, or nobody has been able to tell me as a parliamentarian and as a minister in, this, in, a, in, a, in a former administration, that what our interests in Afghanistan are. Do you um, think that the change in government, the civilian government in Pakistan makes any difference? <coughs> well, Pakistan has been a hybrid now going back uh, decades. So therefore, uh, you know, Mr. Imran Khan unfortunately made that ill-conceived trip to Moscow and I think he wrote his own death warrant. But that unfortunately is the way things run in Pakistan. So 
eventually, if you have another administration, that administration uh, will also not be able to either deal with the India file or the nuclear file, which both remain with the general headquarters in Rawalpindi. So therefore, the best chance that we actually had and we unfortunately missed was when Musharraf was actually wearing the twin hats of president and chief of the army staff. And that was the inflection point when the four-point deal could have, uh, uh, the four-point formula could have gone through. So now, if let's suppose there is a more enlightened uh, general staff in GHQ Rawalpindi, which believes that the zero-sum game that they've been playing, now going back all the way to 1973-74, needs to end, you know, things between India and Pakistan will be transformed overnight. I don't think the civilian government, you know, really has uh, a great lien on it. I recall Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and Rajiv Gandhi tried very hard uh, between 87 and 90. And I saw the U-turn which Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto then did when trouble broke out or, you know, Pakistan-sponsored trouble broke out in uh, Kashmir. And then I've seen the trajectory over all, all these years. So eventually, I think till the time you don't have a mindset change among the core commanders, this India-Pakistan conundrum, which unfortunately holds the prosperity of South Asia hostage, will not get broken. So Shabazz Sharif is making the right noises, but at the end of the day, they are only noises. Stefan, I'm going to come to you um, and, and ask you the question of abandonment as well. Um, because, again, in my time in Afghanistan, in, in Ukraine, you, you hear um, people talk about the West talking about these values they have, and they're willing to, to fight for freedom and f willing to fight for, uh, for those values that they believe in. But then we do see the, the abandonment of Afghanistan, for example, the, the betrayal that many of these young women uh, in Afghanistan and girls are saying that they have faced because they were put out on a limb uh, and told, here, you can be the beacon of hope of Project Afghanistan. We'll fund you, we'll back you, we'll support you, we'll sponsor you, and in the end, we'll leave you to, to these insurgents to decide that you can't go to school, you can't go to work, you can't be uh, within the uh, sort of public domain. So I want to ask, you know, in terms of, does the West really believe in these values? I, I think there are two problems. First, um, we have conflicting and contradicting values. We don't have a clear hierarchy of values. We have the value of human rights, of preserving peace, of freedom, so we have several values which are in a permanent conflict. And I think the discussion we have right now um, in Germany on Ukraine, we have a more intensive discussion on Ukraine than on Afghanistan, shows this uh, and reflects this. Uh, because we started the discussion with the values, we have to preserve peace by dialogue, we have a historic responsibility of Germany invading the Soviet Union, that means we can't deliver weapons to Ukraine, we have to refrain from this conflict as much as possible, and we have to insist on dialogue. Then the discussion changed, and then, okay, now there's also the value that we have to support a country which is invaded by another, by military aggression, and we have to deliver weapons there. And what, what we started to do very lately, but at least we started to do so. And the same with this uh, value of historical responsibility. We neglected the fact that Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union as we invaded it in, in Germany. So they were also victim to our uh, historic failures. So I think that th the real problem is that values are important for foreign policy and to making for making decisions, but they don't provide you with clear gui uh, guidelines on this on these decisions. You have to take into account other factors like interests, costs, risks, prospects of success. All this values alone can't really help you to make uh, difficult decisions. Well, then those values should apply at home as well because foreign policy. Um, did this investigation, this piece, um, just yesterday about how Germany is opening its doors, its homes to Ukrainian refugees. But in order to create those spaces for Ukrainian refugees, they're booting out the Afghan refugees. So I, I, I just want to sort of understand, you know, what is actually happening within the German government, within Germany, in terms of the treatment of these Afghans who have now become displaced and, and have turned up in Germany, um, but are now being thrown out of their homes. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know the figures, uh, but you have to take into account that we in 2015, which in within uh, several months we took in more than one million refugees, not coming from Eastern Europe, but coming from the Middle East and from North Africa. So um, I would also argue that we really did justice to the responsibility we had there. I don't know how many cases we actually had of Afghans really um, um, chased out of, of, of the houses. Uh, but um, I think we accepted the responsibility in 2015. Do you uh, accept responsibility in 2022? Pardon me? Yes, yes. I think we could do more. And, and uh, as you perhaps follow, we have a very intensive discussion in Germany about whether we should also deliver heavy weapons and how, much we, uh, how far we should go in the supporting the Ukrainians. Um, I must admit, the Afghans, yeah. you're, you're talking about Afghanistan. Um, here I agree very much with what was said. Um, I think we also need the additional factor of what is our strategic interest to be engaged there. Um, and I remember very well the um, important phrase made by the Minister of Defense then, um, who said, German security has to be defended right now at the Hindukush because of the threat of terrorism. I think this has changed very much in the past years. Now we have other areas we, where we really use this argument, the Sahel, for example, which, where we are engaged together with France and some other European allies. Um, so, as I said, values and morality are not sufficient really to make uh, difficult decisions. Uh, you need also interests. And in this af case, Afghanistan, I think we lost a lot of strategic interest. I would also ask myself, what is the strategic interest right now and what has it been before? Mm. So, um, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I, on that note, I'm going to open the floor up uh, to some questions. I believe we have um, about 15, uh, 20 minutes uh, of questions. So um, I think there's some mics going around. Please feel free uh, to say who you are and also your question. Yeah, just here. Is there a mic going around? No? Yeah. There is now. <laughs> uh, Andrew Wilder, U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, this has all been looking back, and I'm just wondering if we have a little commentary looking forward. We have a terrible situation, mm -hmm. terrible humanitarian situation, economic situation, but also right now hard to see a way forward politically. Um, and so I'm wondering if some of the panelists, maybe starting with you, Joe Ed, can talk about what do you see as ways forward in Afghanistan? really hard to envision a way forward when the Taliban are putting together this skeleton of um, an Afghan version of an apartheid state. And, and it's tough. It's tough. It's just not just a gender apartheid, but it's also political apartheid because, you know, they've been, you know, largely exclusive. Uh, the government they have is a Taliban only. Um, the, the, the approaches or the policies that they have enacted is also Taliban exclusive or Taliban first, um, mainly because they believe that the Afghan society is not Islamic enough and that they need to re-Islamicize them um, a, in order to make them great again. And, and that is, you know, where we are at a great disadvantage, uh, unfortunately, um, that the very people that are enacting these very policies, uh, which, is wh which are not legislated by a Taliban parliament or a government that's run by the Taliban that's supplemented uh, by you know, uh, some kind of a, a, a legislature, these are basically policy action documents that are enacted by the Taliban called Dastur that are issued by their religious leaders. But uh, our engagement do with those very characters or cast of characters is negligible, unfortunately. While we are jetting around um, Taliban leaders like uh, the Taliban pragmatists uh, around the world, we have ignored the Taliban actual decision makers, unfortunately. And from what I understand, based on my conversation and discussion with people on the ground, is that the Taliban pragmatists, by the real Taliban, I mean, like how they are viewed by the real Taliban, is 
the pragmatists by the real clerks um, are viewed um, as those Taliban among their ranks with low principles. Now, if you're a pragmatist Taliban, which means the other Taliban leaders who have fought um, to take over Afghanistan and fundamentally remold it uh, uh, in your standing um, against it, because you see a very different world, which means you're the one with low principles. Now, how do you change that? You know, we should be jetting around people um, to Norway and Doha and elsewhere, those very people who believe that. Um, and unfortunately, we have it. Now, on the way, lo uh, on the way forward, um, like I, 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 I can't seem to see a way forward with this regime when you, when you, when you are exclusive, when you're Taliban exclusive. The Taliban are struggling to reach some kind of a t intra Taliban settlement among themselves. Um, I mean, they're not even Taliban exclusive. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tougher. It's really hard. And in this case, we need to have m a lot more insights into the inner workings of who the Taliban are, or who their decision makers are, or how they arrive at those decisions, how they deliberate. Um, we have zero insights into that, and I think that puts us at a great disadvantage. Humanitarian assistance is uh, just a Band-Aid. You know, you cannot run a, a, human, a, a government on humanitarian assistance. You know, the United States used to spend, um, what was that, like about um, uh, $80 million a day. Uh, and of course, there were different pockets of that cost that went to the counterterrorism, the civilian assistance, but also the Afghan train advise and assist mission. But still, um, even, you know, if you... Um, if you support uh, the Afghan uh, or the Taliban administration right now, um, you need to be able to get something or extract something in return for it. That is not the administration you're, uh, you're, you're dealing with right now. We are at our weakest um, um, than we have ever been. And I think, uh, and, and let, me, let me just finish with this, is that I think the Taliban are incapable of change, incapable of change. And they have always been incapable of change, just that we did not recognize it. But we were rushing for an exit, and that's exactly what we, we did. Um, it was perfectly fine, because interests were important. You know, as um, Stefan spoke of, um, and some interests for some countries are much more important than other interests. Uh, yeah, I just want to come to Lisa, because actually, Lisa, you wrote a piece about how to help on the humanitarian side, how to deliver aid without helping the Taliban. Yes, thank you. Um, I think in moving forward, uh, obviously the United States cannot uh, turn, turn its back on Afghanistan. Um, we have withdrawn all our forces. Uh, we're not going to be sending forces back anytime soon. Uh, but we can certainly remain engaged. Um, and I think we should, our engagement should be on three levels. Humanitarian, definitely. Um, and the U.S. has provided uh, a great deal of humanitarian assistance, over 500 million uh, since August, um, but human rights as well. And here, let's just be clear, the Taliban uh, failed a major test when they reneged on their promise to allow girls to go back to school on March 23rd. It's a month later, uh, girls are still not allowed to attend high school. Uh, let's just think about what that means. Um, we, we simply must condition our assistance. If we're going to provide assistance to Afghanistan's education sector, uh, we should be demanding that all women and girls can attend school, uh, that women can work outside the home, that they can travel freely. Uh, because frankly, things are moving in, in, uh, from bad to worse in Afghanistan, not only with the humanitarian situ situation, but also with women's rights. Um, and the third is security. As you said, um, we had a string of attacks. 
And uh, so, you know, what we can do in terms of the terrorism issue, we should. Now our hands are constrained. We don't have troops on the ground. We don't have local forces to work with. Um, but if there are ways we can work with the region, with some of our regional partners in Central Asia um, or others to try to uh, help get a handle on the terrorism problem, uh, we should certainly be doing that. Um, but I think we should be, uh, just one more point, I think we should be working closely with Europe. Um, Germany has long been involved in Afghanistan, providing assistance before the Taliban. Um, Germany was actively engaged in providing assistance to the Afghan people. And, uh, you know, we should be working with the European countries who share our values, um, who want to see uh, women's rights respected, and develop a roadmap forward. You know, and, and, you know, we have to engage with the Taliban, but we don't have to legitimize them. We don't have to give them diplomatic re recognition. We should keep our sanctions on uh, Taliban leaders who have been involved in terrorism. Um, you know, this idea of working with Russia, China, and Pakistan, the so-called Troika Plus, I guess it doesn't hurt to keep these countries engaged, but we sure, certainly should not have high expectations that we're going to achieve much. Um, the Russians and Chinese don't really care about women's rights. Uh, Pakistan is responsible for uh, the Taliban coming back to power there. So I think we're better off developing a roadmap with our European friends who do care about the country and uh, what happens there. Uh, so that would be my advice. I, I just wanted to ask you, Lisa, I mean, do you think that there should be some kind of humanitarian mission that the United States has in country alongside the um, Europeans without it being, you know, a diplomatic mission, but purely humanitarian, also to have eyes and ears on the ground. Absolutely. Um, we definitely um, owe it to the Afghans, we owe it to humanity, uh, to make sure there's not a humanitarian catastrophe uh, that we already see signs of underway. So yes, the US has a responsibility to help with humanitarian assistance. And we can do that, again, without legitimizing the Taliban. Uh, so there's no question. Um, the U.S. is involved with this. Many other countries are. Uh, international institutions, the World Bank, is uh, finding ways to get assistance out. The U.N. is very much there. Uh, so this is a, a responsibility of the international community um, to not allow the Afghans to go hun hungry to suffer. Um, but again, I think when it comes to longer term assistance, uh, we need to be very careful that we're conditioning that on the Taliban uh, living up to certain um, you know, basic human rights principles. Um, I think Shuf, uh, you had a question. Yeah. This is Ayan, I'm an Indian journalist. I also write for the Kama, the number one digital platform. And also must introduce myself. I'm a big fan of Pialda Hakim, who made me a journalist from a unchattered, unknown village of India, uh, just by her show. So the thing is, if it's not Taliban, will it be NRF? And how the West will uh, look the alliance of, of, of the Hung uh, with the Haqqani network? Thank you. I think the question was about whether the West should support um, an armed resistance of some kind in Afghanistan. I think we need to look beyond individuals and into movements. Uh, unfortunately, the NRF, um, you know, as much as I empathize with their cause uh, for very, very good reasons, it's not yet a national movement. Um, it's not national. It's not a movement yet mainly because you know it does not involve unfortunately yet or as yet um, a, a broad stroke of the Afghan ethnic groups or the society. Um, y you cannot run a movement based uh, principally um, uh, with uh, just one uh, with, with like with one um, ethnic group. So if you want to make it national, you need to be able to um, appeal to the broader, uh, respect of the Afghan society. Um, again, I think this is this is our um, you know fundamental problem is that we have historically looked at individuals rather than um, 
you know, national movements as a solution. Um, there's not a single, uh, uh, you know, national movement that exists right now. I mean, and our ref is. I mean, maybe they call themselves national right now, but it's not an, it's not yet national. There's about ten different groups, associations, political groups, armed groups um, that have forms um, that have some form um, um, to uh, against against the Taliban. Some are based inside Afghanistan. Some are outside Afghanistan, um, they haven't been helpful, unfortunately. You know, one of the things that I, I really thought that the Afghan collapse would, would really help would be coalesce the, um, the Afghan people um, and kind of essentially unite them. Um, I was wrong. I was, I was very, very wrong. Um, instead of uniting them, it has really dispersed them. I mean, I, I, I just came from Washington and we had a, a, a very interesting, uh, I'm, I'm on this um, U.S. National Welcome Coalition. We had a very interesting um, uh, discussion with the Afghan diaspora, which have since been evacuated into uh, the United States. And um, they were largely divided. And, the, and, and this is basically the diaspora that has been educated, or basically the... Um, the ones that have benefited from 20 years of American engagement or Western engagement, um, that hasn't helped them to unite against a single uh, cause or find a common purpose um, and have a unity of command. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a Dalai Lama-like figure uh, that could coalesce the entire country around it, uh, himself or herself. Um, um, so again, we need to kind of look beyond individuals and in, in, like into movements that are um, functional. But you also need to gauge, you know, Western interests in that respect. I, we, we've just got like five minutes to go, so I'm going to take like a few questions. So I'll come to Shulkia and then we'll go to the. Uh, Uh, thank you. I'm Shuvalay Majumdar, McDonald Laurie Institute. I'll keep my question short. Uh, each of you have acknowledged Pakistan's complicity one way or another in this. None of you have recommended sanctioning Pakistan, the core commanders of the ISI, or isolating the leadership in Pakistan that's responsible for a 20-year war in Afghanistan and its ongoing turmoil. Why not sanction Pakistan? Thank you very much. My name is Elizabeth. I'm from the Truman Institute for International and Security Affairs. My question very much relates to what um, you have just mentioned. Uh, regarding Pakistan's role, I was wondering, would you argue that like, the military cooperation with, with Pakistan kind of had a very great impact on how the situation in Afghanistan and with the Taliban actually evolve, evolved? Uh, the United States were cutting um, off the um, military aid to Pakistan from 2010 to 2017, and then the Russians were stepping in. So how can we like ever compare Ukraine with Afghanistan if we have like this hot pot with so many different interests? Thank you very much. There's just one more question at the back. I'll let you, and then, because there's two on the back. Thank you very much, Patrick Kugel. Uh, I come from Poland, Polish Institute of International Affairs. I have also a follow-up question to, uh, to Pakistan. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what does it mean the Afghan led, uh, Taliban led Afghanistan for Pakistan? We have heard about almost daily clashes at the border, growing tensions, airstrikes on Afghanistan ground, and, and uh, etc. Isn't it like the Pakistan got what it deserved in, in terms that it, Talib, um, Afghanistan will be ma mainly problem for Pakistan, not for India at the moment? How do you see the future? Yeah. Why don't you answer uh, all three? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I just want to see. I actually think the better question would have been not was our no. that we got our Afghanistan policy wrong, yeah. but that we got our Pakistan policy wrong for so long. And you know, I I I, I my I was assigned to Korea twenty about twenty five years after my dad fought in the Korean War. And if you if you looked at Korea in nineteen seventy seven, you would see a country that did not look terribly different than Afghanistan. It was not a democracy in any way, shape, or form. It was very poor. It was very corrupt. And, you, and, and if we left in 1977, you would say, another example of American failure at nation building. And, and 20 years later, you have a vibrant economy, a vibrant democracy. And one, it's a reminder that, look, f 
first of all, I don't think nation building is a real thing. Nations rebuild themselves. There is no linear timeline for that. There is no calendar. It happens when it happens because of leaders, because of people, because of history, because of circumstances. There is no guarantee. But here's the important thing. Why did we stay? And we didn't stay because we thought South Korea was going to be a land of milk and honey. We stayed because there was an American interest to stay, because we thought a war would be stabilizing through Northeast Asia. And we would still be there today if South Korea was still corrupt, because we still believe in that interest. And the point uh, how this relates to Afghanistan is the difference between South Korea and Afghanistan was South Korea was a country that could be isolated. You secured that border, and that country, the only real variables on how that country developed were inside that country. That was never, ever true in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the playground of everybody, right? And as long as you have an open border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, how can you ever talk about an Afghan solution for the future of Afghanistan? So I think American policy towards Pakistan has to change. I think it's fundamentally flawed. It'll never contribute to a better Afghanistan. I think it's, a, I think it's actually a hindrance in the U.S.-Indian um, relationship, which I think is the single most important relationship in South Asia. I think America needs to look in the mirror and say that nothing that we have done with Pakistan since Pakistan was born has worked. And it is not a relationship that is serving America's interest. And unless we have a Pakistan that is very, very different than the Pakistan that we have today, the United States has no business doing business with that country. I think that's the hard choice we need to make. <coughs> Look, uh, on this whole business of sanction or sanctioning Pakistan, well, uh, the US and the Western allies went after Taliban for 20 years, right? And uh, they were able to sort of outrun them. And I don't think any Western sanctions or American sanctions against Pakistan are really going to work. The US and the Western Alliance had a chance between 2001 and 2021, and they blew it. I mean, they knew that the Quetta Shura was being supported by Pakistan, Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistan, but notwithstanding that, the military relationship between the Pentagon and the generals in Rawalpindi never really substantively changed. So Pakistan as a society will have to find its own equilibrium. It's not found an equilibrium in the past 70 years. It may take another 30 years, or it may take more. But that's something we'll have to live with. If somebody is under the delusional uh, feeling that using outside pressure will bring about behavior change, I think that's a, that's a huge mistake. Uh, strengthening the democratic forces in Pakistan, uh, ensuring that the role of the military uh, to the extent that it can be lessened in the public affairs of Pakistan, those are the strategies uh, which would really work. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, this heavy-handed, ham-handed sanctions business is really going to get anybody anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank my panelists here this evening. <laughs>